Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 16. I had a thought last night. Isn't that good? <laughs> I savor those things nowadays. And don't get mad at me, but I want to speak something that I believe is true. I do believe we should be good citizens. I do believe we should vote. I do believe we should be salt and light. But the fact of the matter is the Republican Party and the Democratic Party will not last forever. Now what I'm about to say you may not say amen to. But if history holds true, nations like the United States will not last forever. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will last forever. Amen. Amen. So I don't know who's going to win. For some people a win is a loss. I don't know who's going to be in the governor's seat or in the mayor's seat or in the president's seat, but I know who's going to be on the throne. Amen. And that's the Lord Jesus, the one who died for our sins. When you go to Israel, Steve's taken a group to, Wiggins has taken a group, I think in May or June, May I believe, and then I'm taking a group next spring, about this time next year. One of the places you go is to Caesarea Philippi. And I'll talk more about it momentarily. But it was the watershed moment of Jesus' ministry. And there Peter had a complete revelation from God. And just a few minutes later came dangerously close to blaspheming God. Can I get a witness? Sometimes we can be so holy and so fleshly at the same time. But through it all, Jesus is going to build his church. Look at Matthew 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples repeatedly. He was saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered. Here's his high moment. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, that is, son of John, <coughs> because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Hey, look at me. Bad idea. <laughs> Saying, God forbid it, Lord. That's light. The, the language is even more severe in the original. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but on man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself. He must take up his cross. He must follow me. Deny self, take up cross, follow me. Deny self, take up cross, follow me. What are you going to do today? Deny self. Take up cross, follow Jesus. What are you going to do tomorrow? Deny self. Thank you very much. Life's simple, right? Just wake up and die. Isn't that right? Amen. 
Then Jesus, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? Uh, number one, let's look at the supreme question. The supreme question, beginning at verse 13. Now, Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. What's he doing? He's on his way to the cross. He knows that. And he's retreating. He's taking a retreat with his disciples. I want to say this to you. One of the best things you can do is not just take a vacation to go relax, but sometimes just take a vacation and pull away and be with Jesus. Take a Bible, take a hymnal, take whatever, scripture cards, prayer cards, and just take a day or two and get away with the Lord. You may want to go with your spouse. You may want to go by yourself. No television, no social media, just get away. Jesus constantly was doing this. And he goes to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is about 25 miles northeast of um, Jerusalem, or, or uh, uh, for the Sea of Galilee. It had been an epicenter of many religions. In Old Testament times, there were no fewer than 14 altars and temples dedicated to Baal where they would sacrifice children there at that place. It was also a place where the Greeks celebrated the god of Pan. They called him Pan. That's where you get the word pantheism. The place of Pan. It's called Bonius today instead of Pontius. And then Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that the fountain waters of the Jordan River came from Caesarea Philippi. And if you know anything about the Jordan River, it supplies almost half of Israel's water today. But then there was another temple there. Not only the Canaanite temples of Baal, not only the Greek temples of Pan, but there were temples erected by Herod the Great to commemorate Caesar. And this is one of the places where emperor worship took place. So when Jesus went there, he was saying, you see all these gods? See where Baal was? See all the remnants of Baal's temples, 14 of them? Do you see the the temple of Banias, do you see, or Panias, do you see all of this erected to Caesar among all these gods? Who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? That's pretty bold, is it not? Amen. Son of man occurs 30 times in Matthew's gospel. It's a messianic term. Probably one of the most important places where it's found is in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, where Daniel had a vision into heaven. He said, I kept looking into the night vision. And behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like the Son of Man was coming. He came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. Now, let me just tell you who this is. The Son of Man is Jesus. The Ancient of Days is God the Father, and he's coming up. To the Father right now, that's in, the, in this picture. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion, that is the dominion of the Son of God, the dominion of the Messiah, the dominion of the Son of Man, will not, is everla an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. That's what I was trying to tell you a while ago. Countries come and go. Political parties come and go, people come and go, but praise God, Jesus is the rock. Amen. And he does not come and go. And by the way, you know why we ought to gather like this? It does me good to walk through that door and to see y'all here. Amen. And to say, praise God, I'm not the only guy in love with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Not that I'm the only one. I'm, I didn't mean it like that. I'm just saying, I just, I just praise God that there are other people that love Jesus. I praise God that there are other men that want to read their Bible and want to know what God has to say. They're, they're not perfect. I'm not perfect, but we're coming together and saying we're men and we're in this culture and we're 
We're just pilgrims passing through, and we need help, but we need fellowship, and it just does us good. Iron sharpens iron, so, iron, so one man sharpens another. Just to be in this place will help you as being a Christian. Yes. Coming together with men and worshiping the Son of Man who has been given authority through the Ancient of Days. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, verse 14, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say the prophets. Jeremiah, or John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the first prophet in 400 years. Very charismatic person. A biological relative of Jesus. And Jesus was the one to whom John was pointing. Was pointing. John stated plainly he was not the Messiah. He was an Elijah figure. And then they said, how about Elijah? Maybe the Son of Man was Elijah. If you read the last chapter of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, in verses 5 through 7, Malachi prophesies that Elijah will come and then the Great One will come, the Messiah will come. Well, we know that that Elijah figure was John the Baptist, Jesus said so. But even Elijah himself was not the Son of Man. Even though it's really interesting, go study the book of, or the, the, the life of Elijah and you'll see that Jesus performed many of his miracles in the New Testament and they were patterned after the miracles of Elijah and Elisha. And then they said, Jeremiah. Why Jeremiah? Because every time you turn around, Jesus was quoting Jeremiah. He quoted Jeremiah more than any other Old Testament prophet. And then maybe just one of the other prophets. We don't know who he is. Maybe he's a prophet. Well, he was a prophet, all right, but he was a prophet that would follow Moses. He was the one of whom the prophet spoke. Jesus was the Son of Man. And then he said to them, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? Now, these are the same questions, really. Who is the Son of Man? Who is the Messiah? And who do you say I am? Same answer, the Messiah. And he would say it in a moment, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And these questions are the greatest statements perhaps in the Bible. How do, how do you answer this question? Who do you think Jesus is? Some of you probably think, well, he was a good man preacher. He was no doubt a very good speaker and a good teacher and a good Jewish rabbi, but I don't believe he was the Messiah. I don't believe he was the Christ. I sure don't believe he was the Son of God. Well, how do you explain his life? How do you explain the amazing miracles that four Gospels attested to? How do you explain his teachings that have survived, and not only survived, but have flourished for 2,000 years? How superior to any kind of philosophy you can come up with, by the way, how do you explain the fact that the people who followed him said, we saw him, he, had, he rose from the dead, he's not dead. How do you explain millions and millions and millions of followers after 2,000 years have passed and their lives are radically changed? How do you explain when somebody comes to Jesus, they turn from a drunk into somebody that's sober, they turn to somebody that, that's cursing, to somebody that starts speaking godly words? How do you explain somebody that was always angry and now all of a sudden they're walking in peace? How do you explain the changed lives? How do you explain the fact that millions of Christians have been willing to die a terrible martyr's death? Because they would not deny the Lord Jesus Christ. And how do you explain after 2,000 years the movement of Christianity is not going down worldwide. It's going up. <coughs> and, and I just want you to know, you, you may think that Jesus is just a man. But if he were just a man, this whole thing would have been dead a long time ago. Amen. He's not just a man. He's the son of man. Amen. He's the Messiah. And you need to answer the supreme question. Jesus is asking you today. He's asking you, sir, who do you say that I am? Be careful how you answer that question. Supreme question. Number two, the simple answer. Verse 16. And here's our man, Peter. That's who we're studying this semester. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's in the Hebrew parallelism. You're the Christ, 
You're not only the son of man, you're the son of the living God. The living God. I like that. God's not dead. He's alive. Peter didn't always get things right, did he? But boy, he got it right this time. Before anybody else could respond, Peter nailed the answer. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the Messiah, the son of the living God. You are Daniel's son of man. You are the one who came up to the ancient of days. You are the one who was presented before him. You are the one to whom he gave dominion and glory and a kingdom that all the peoples and nations and men of every language might serve you, Jesus. Your dominion, Jesus, is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. Your kingdom, Jesus, is one which will not be destroyed. Jesus, you are the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. And Jesus rewarded him. He said in verse 17, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, son of John, because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. You're walking in the Spirit, son. Good job. My Father who is in heaven did. Bingo, Peter, you got it. Only God, my Father, could have revealed that to you. He's the one who gave you that correct answer. And I want to ask you again. The Lord is the only one who can give you that correct answer. Will you today believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, with, we've got several hundred men here. There's no doubt there's somebody here that doesn't know the Lord. Somebody brought you. Maybe you just walked in. Maybe you are hungry for the Lord. You need to come to the point where Peter did. Peter, in the context here, this is kind of when you're talking about the church starting out. It's almost like Peter becomes the first church member. He's the first one to go through 101. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And uh, have you ever come to Christ? Have you ever confessed, you're the Christ, you're my Christ, you're my Savior, you're my Lord? Have you ever repented of your sins? Have you ever turned from your sin by the help of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever believed that Jesus died for your sins and that he rose from the dead to give you eternal life? Have you ever received him and said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, change me? So that I can say, you are my Christ. You're the son of the living God. Simple answer. Correct answer to the supreme question. And then the sure victory. Look at verse 18. I say, also say to you that you are Peter, that is Petros. <coughs> Excuse me. Upon this rock, Petra. I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. You know, you've heard sermons on this passage. You know that there's a play on words in the original language. Peter's name, Petros, relatively small stone. Upon this rock, Petra, a different stone, a foundational stone, I will build my church. And the word play shows that Jesus was not building his church on the Apostle Peter. And I'm grateful, aren't you? Because it wouldn't be long that he was going to call him Satan, all right? And he would also deny him three times. Contrary to what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, Peter was not the first pope. Peter does not have the keys. When you go to, for instance, Capernaum, and you walk into the area there, where Peter's house had been, there's a, picture, there's a big statue of Peter there and he's holding the keys. Well, I got news for you. Jesus has the keys. Amen. Peter would have lost them, amen? I mean, I'm, I mean, every guy loses keys, all right? But Jesus is the one that went into hell and got the keys. Jesus has the keys. I'm not mad at you if you're Roman Catholic, but uh, Peter was not the first pope. And if you think he is, then the first pope was married. <laughs> All right? Just a thought. <laughs> Church is built on Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then verse 19, 
I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. You say, I thought that Peter didn't have the keys. We've all got the keys. Let me tell you what he's doing here. He's giving us not, we're not powerful in and of ourselves, but we have been invested with spiritual authority. If you're a Christian, God grants you usage of the keys and you can bind and you can loosen. When you go into prayer, you don't pray in your own authority. You don't pray in the authority of the church. You pray in the authority of the one who has the keys and that's Jesus. He loans you the keys while you're praying. So when I go into my prayer closet, I'm not just you know, hoping good things will happen. I have been authorized. I have authority. The power is not in me. The power is in God, but I have authority. It's like these policemen out here that work and do such a great job parking our cars. They walk out there with those lights and those vests and those shiny badges and they say stop and cars that weigh half a ton will stop. Why? Because they have power to stop them. They don't have power. They've got authority. They represent somebody else that has the power. And if you mess with that police offer, officer, <laughs> officer, <laughs> officer, you got the whole Memphis government after you now. And if you mess with them, you'll have the whole state after you. And if you mess with them, you'll have the whole country. You don't mess with the policeman. You don't mess with somebody in authority. And in the spirit realm, you have been deputized. You are a person with divine authority. You have the keys. God loans you the keys. And when you, you say, how do I operate in that? Here's how you operate in it. In prayer. That's why we're always talking about prayer here. Because it, look at me. You can get everything else right. But if you don't pray, you don't get anything right. <laughs> prayer is the foundation. It's not just something that we're trying to make you sound holy. It's how you function in the Christian life. And if you're going to walk in victory, you've got to use the keys. You say, okay, how do I bind something? Here's how you bind it. I come against that spirit of selfishness. I come against that spirit of gluttony. I come against that spirit of anger. I come against that spirit of fear. God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. What's that? Scripture. You're turning the keys every time you do. I, I bind that in the name of Jesus and I loosen unto all my family love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I pray over my family, the Word of God, the will of God, the name of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. What am I doing? I'm using the keys in authority. And say, in the name of Jesus, I will walk in victory. I will not walk in depression. I will not walk in fear. I will not walk in lust. I will not walk in anger. I will not be moody all the time. I will walk in victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I stand against every spirit that would try to oppose me. And I have been granted usage of the keys that my Savior holds in His nail-scarred hand. And I will walk in the authority of God. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said, in verse, uh, in Luke 10, 19, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. He's not talking about bugs. Because he goes on to say, and over all the power of the enemy. He's talking about demons. I give you authority, not power, authority. To tread upon demonic spirits. Over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. Amen belongs there. Amen. And I could stay on this a long time, don't have time. But you look at me. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And let me say the other side of this. What you don't bind on earth will not be bound in heaven. And what you don't loose will not be loosed in heaven. And some of you need to start binding and loosing. Binding the evil and loosing the good. The sure victory. 
Number four, the surprising method. How, how do we get all this? Through the cross. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, be killed and be raised up on the third day. Watershed verse is verse 20. That's the watershed verse in the whole Gospel of Matthew. From here on, it's the cross and the resurrection. Up to this point, who is Jesus? Now, we know that. Okay, let me tell you. Now that you know who I am, let me tell you why I'm here. I was born to go to the cross. I was born to die as an atoning sacrifice for the sins of mankind. I was born to go to a grave. I was born to rise from the dead with the keys to death, hell, and the grave in my hand. I was born to suffer all that, and I'm going to ascend to heaven, and I will build my church upon my death, burial, and resurrection. I got to go to the cross. But the Jews couldn't understand it. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.13, but we preach Christ, Paul said, we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, that's a stumbling block. To the Gentiles, it's foolishness. But to those of us who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Jews felt like if, if you die on a cross, the Old Testament said in Deuteronomy, you're under a curse. How can the Messiah be cursed? That was the problem in the book of Acts. The Jewish people couldn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah he did all these miracles and all this other stuff, but he died on the cross. That eliminates him. He couldn't be the, the Christ or he wouldn't be cursed. But see, Jesus was cursed for you and for me. He became our curse and he paid the penalty on the cross. The surprising method. And then finally, the surrendered disciple. Look at verses 22 through 25. Some of the most famous scripture Jesus ever quoted. <clears throat> Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter rebuked Jesus, and Jesus rebuked him more than Peter had rebuked him. Look at verse 23. Don't get into a rebuking contest with Jesus. He turned out and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's pretty stout stuff. You're a stumbling block to me. Jesus said, if you're a stumbling block, you ought to have a millstone tied around your neck and be thrown into the sea. You're a stumbling block, Peter. You're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Well, that's a temptation for us all, is it not? Then Jesus goes off, man. I mean, he, he just starts preaching a sermon right there in Caesarea Philippi. He said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. What's a cross for? Crucifixion, dying. You've got to take up your cross. And the Bible says, by the way, in Luke's gospel, you've got to do it every day. And you've got to follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You want to follow me? Die to yourself every day. Die to yourself every day. And it hurts. Our flesh is stubborn. Our fleshly selfish ways. If you're married, that one of the main, I think, probably one of if not the main reason for marriage is sanctification because we're constantly having to die to ourselves. but Paul talked about it when he said in these famous words in Galatians 2 20 I've been crucified with Christ it's no longer I who live but it's Christ who lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me and Jesus closes with these words, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? It doesn't matter how many riches you have in this world if you die and go to hell and you lose your soul. Who do men say that Jesus is? There's a lot of answers to that, but the big question is, who do you say that Jesus is? 
Who do you say? I made up my mind a long time ago, way before I went to seminary, way before I'd read the Bible through. I fell in love with Jesus. And all I knew was he's the son of the living God. He is my savior. I pray that he's your savior as well. And I thank God that he lets us use the keys to pray. Some of you could prevent some things from happening that would be bad in your family if you'd pray. Some of you could bring blessings into your family if you would pray more. There's keys out there <laughs> that operate in the spirit realm. And they're available to you. You don't have to have a position in the church to use the keys. You just have to be positioned in Christ. So I encourage you. Jesus is building his church. Nothing wrong with voting, nothing wrong with being part of groups, but the main thing you'd better be involved in is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God will build his church. Doesn't matter who's in the Supreme Court, God is the Supreme Court. God will build his church. I say it doesn't matter. Sure it matters if we live. I get all that. But ultimately, the main thing is be part of the church. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for these men. And God, thank you for Peter. He got it oh so right, then he got it oh so wrong, and we oh so understand. Thank you for his life. Thank you for this time to be together. Thank you for the fellowship. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the friendships that are being cultivated. Thank you, Lord God, that we can be around other godly men. And Lord, we're not alone. You're with us, and we have this band of brothers, and we're grateful. Help us, Lord, today to live knowing that we are on the rock of ages. You are our rock. We shall not be moved. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.